So my name is Robert Geyer. Uh, as most of you can identify from my accent, I'm originally from the United States, uh, originally from California. Um, got my PhD out of University of Wisconsin, uh, but studied uh, abroad in the, in the UK and in France a long time ago, and uh, also in Norway. Um, uh, I've been working in the UK now for going on 22 years. I was 10 years at University of Liverpool, uh, and um, 12 years now at uh, Lancaster University. Um, so, real quick, you know, what I want to do a pitch today is, in essence, and I don't know how much this is preaching to the converted, so we'll see how this goes. It's just a very fast general argument on the relevance of complexity of health. Uh, my uh, I've been working on complexity for 18 years. I teach complexity in policy, complexity, uh, managing the complex policy issues, uh, and uh, in essence, complexity politics and policy. Uh, for me, uh, complexity is a meta-theoretical framework with fractal properties. That's a bit fancy. It basically says it applies. It's fantastic. When I'm teaching this, I always try to bounce back and forth between. It works at different levels. So you can talk about institutional structures, you can talk about country policies, you can talk about global pro processes, you can also talk about individuals <coughs> and how they manage themselves as a complex uh, actor that I find really exciting. And uh, for the last, after I kind of got into it, most of my work is how do you make complexity relevant and usable for policy actors? So it's a fancy word, it's kind of faddish. What do you do to actually sort of help them come to grips with it? And a lot of that is the battle over um, the tendency towards evidence-based policy making, if you will, attempts to order and the audit and target culture that's emerged. This is very much in the UK. The UK has a highly centralized governmental structure uh, that uh, lots of people don't realize just how centralized it is. Brexit is, at, is actually amplifying that process. Uh, so a lot of the work that I do is about trying to get central actors to allow uh, localized actors more degrees of freedom. Uh, so in essence, lacking that in the Canadian context with a provincial federal structure, you have more of that history of that. So it'll be interesting. And then I tend to bounce around a lot uh, in the health field, worked on diabetes, drugs and drug advertising, GP commissioning doctor, which is a new thing, health policy organization. Key questions for today, uh, what's the difference between orderly and complexity thinking? How does this re relate to health? And I'll use diabetes as an example of uh, when we go down to a particular. And just a few thoughts, I was asked uh, to look at the special edition by Colleen in the Journal of Health Law. Journal of Health Economics Policy. Health Economics, yeah, I forgot the sequence. Uh, and I looked at some of the articles there and was trying to, so I just want to flag up a few things on that. Long lecture on all of this. This is, I was thinking, you know, how to compress this correctly, because uh, this is, you know, take lots of time sort of explaining this. So if you will, uh, you've got this, what I've always called this sort of paradigm of order, emerges very much out of the traditional scientific framework based on sort of Newton and uh, Descartes. Newton with the idea of, of universal laws, Descartes with the idea, I think, you know, Kate rational, uh, in a sense of rationalism, we can know our world, uh, gives you a vision of sort of the world of, of a mechanical clock. And there's four rules to that world. Causality, uh, giving causes that lead to known effects, reductionism, behavior of the system, clock profession. You can observe the behavior, know that there's no hidden surprise that the clock doesn't change, it doesn't alter itself. Predictability, once global uh, behavior is defined, Future course of events that are predicted, you'll know the clock will, will flow in certain processes. And determinism, it'll go, you'll know if you set it and look at it again in 12 hours, the hands will have rolled around, and you'll be able to determine where it goes. Clear uh, beginnings, rational, uh, rational ends. So in this sense, health policy in an orderly perspective, if you have causality, more targets will lead to greater control and efficiency. So if I've got a hospital, I want them to run better. Uh, I want to reduce the mortality rate. I want to increase cancer care. I'll give them a target. And I can be confident if I control them and pressure them enough, I'll have greater control and will generate more efficient outcomes. Reductionism. I can separate the targets of that hospital. I can say to them, right, I want to increase diabetes care. I want to increase child care. And I want you to increase elderly. And I'll to, uh, allocate certain targets for you to do that. And they're separate. I can evaluate them each independently. 
Predictability. If I add money, I mean, if you like to do a physical analogy, if I add energy to the system and I've directed it properly, health will improve. So I'll spend more, I expect uh, to the outcomes to improve. Determinism. Not only do I spend more, we know how to improve health in the long run. So if I do these things now, I add energy, I uh, increase patient compliance, I know that that will lead to a better outcome over time. Okay? Fundamentally, if you will, this is based on those core rules. Patient care, causality, interventions will lead to health improvement. So if I intervene in that pension, I've identified the problem with them, I'm going to intervene, it will lead to improvement. Reductionism, illnesses can be isolated from the individual. I can separate out, yes, we haven't identified the individual, the individual itself is almost irrelevant to the illness. So I can identify it, I can cure it, I can intervene in whatever fashion. Predictability, more interventions will lead to health improvement. Determinism, you know how to improve an individual's health in the long run. Okay? So if you will, these are just the implications from that, if you will, orderly vision. Health sciences, under this orderly vision, uh, you can go back, lots and lots of history behind this, you can explore all this stuff. Rise of a scientific approach to medicine. You go back a couple hundred years, medicine had a much more interactive relationship with patients, so, uh, to health subsequent right? Growth of large scale hierarchical organizations, large scale hospitals, etc. Growth of specialization, differentiation. Doctor becomes the authoritative expert. Patient becomes increasingly passive. And health, in a sense, is a linear mechanical process linked to testing and specialization such that you can establish clear protocols and processes, uh, and the growth of the modern hospital is, you know, it's linked to that. And that's not all, I don't mean to say this is all bad, I just mean to sort of drive out the perspective this does. Now, just jumping to diabetes, uh, just going back and to show the historical basis of all this. So you had George Harley at the University of College London, outlined in the 1860s, very restrictive diet with diabetes, aimed at eliminating all sugars, meat, the biggest problem was that patients were constantly trying to sneak bread. Um, again, Italian diabetes specialist, late 19th century, Catoni, keep his, had to lock up his patients in order to control them to get them to follow their diets. H.G. Wells, the famous author, was a diabetic, founder of Diabetes UK. Our characters are strengthened by perpetual self-control. In essence, the key problem from a position of Orderly. We know what the problems we're doing. It's a matter of getting those darn patients to follow what they're told. And it's just a question of how much we can force them. Okay. And we even imprison them. Um, now, what happens? So that's at a patient level. Now, what's happened is let's look at it at a larger organizational level. Again, as I say, the UK system is phenomenally centralized. And what happens is this idea of this constant pursuit of order has led to massive reorganizations. So the UK has gone through over. 23 organizations, uh, reorganizations in the last 25 years. The latest one is called commissioning, so you have commissioning care, care commissioning organizations being done. You have uh, political elites get wrapped up in this, trying to show that they're in control of the system. So you have a sort of what's called an in my time suit. You have a new secretary of health, and this is a colleague of mine had this in my time concept. It says, in my time, I will improve health. I'm here. The person before me was a disaster. We're here to rescue the system. And they do various they do various reorganizations, pull various levers, and then the next Minister of Health shows up and says, Oh, what a disaster. You know, now in my time I'm gonna rescue the system. And more levers are more things are twisted. And the next one shows up. So we have a continual process of this. Now is all this keeping the national health system healthy or undermining it? Again, it depends on how you look at it. From a traditional warrior approach. In a way, this constant search for order, finding the final order, is the only way to say that from a complexity perspective, this might have good benefits to it, certainly good, but actually it might be stifling learning adaptability and flexibility in the long run. The other thing is local actors aren't stupid. They learn to adapt and adjust to the system and will often learn to adapt and cheat on targets. Okay? Key example that I often use, I had a great conversation with a friend of mine who's a CEO at a hospital. We are having a beer and he was saying, you know, in a sense he's trying to say, well, targets are always being manipulated by various ways. I said, 
I said, well, he just gave me a challenge to find one that nobody could cheat on. I said, right, death toll for surgical units, okay? I said, death toll for surgical units, you, you know, you see if a patient dies, they can't bury the body, they've got to say it, and I can then quickly count how many people die from a particular surgical unit. He said, oh, that's easy. And I was like, what? And he said, he said well, yeah, if a surgical new unit knew that its financial sta status and, it, and its reputation was based on lowering its, its uh, uh, death rate, said, oh, that's easy. They immediately quit uh, uh, operating on uh, uh, questionable cases. So don't operate on the sick, only operate on the healthy. And boom, their success rate jumps up. They look like they're geniuses, okay? So again, in this system, uh, coming from that perspective, you know, again, you're basically assuming that all the actors are passive and do as they're told, whereas they're constantly going. Lots of challenges to this vision of order, okay? As you easily go back, I'm just pulling some ones out of diabetes. Uh, this is 1907, so, you know, over 100 years ago. Regarding Massachusetts female diabetic, it was useless to hand her a diet list without finding out whether she can get at her boarding house any such diet. Turns out she cannot, there's no boarding house diabetic, she had to spend the money on diets. Shall we simply pass to the next case and let the woman's disease run on to its fatal termination? Unimpeded, the physician in charge has no time to investigate her case. He needs the help of social work. So in other words, the relationship between the social and health becomes obvious. You know, this isn't new, okay? So, uh, and the problems you know, of, the, of this vision of order in health and medicine aren't new. Technical knowledge grows, no question, but the disease doesn't end. It takes different shapes. Specialization is always limited by holistic problems. More testing, more evidence in many complex cases and things doesn't actually give you much more to go on. Institutions of medicine and health create their own problems. They're social institutions, and they generate their own. Doctors may feel around patients excluded. Growing importance of things like social determinants of health, I think of it as the sort of public <laughs> side of the health sphere. And you've got all your negative representations, Frankenstein, Jekyll and Hyde, one flew over the cuckoo and that's showing my age here, remembering these old films. There's been more modern ones too. Uh, so how do you, what's a different framework? And I'm, you know, this is our rushing through this. Uh, what often I'll take my students, you know, uh, lectures and lectures to get through. But in essence, there's a different way of do it, thinking of it. And if looking at it from a complex systems, you wind up changing your four rules. So in complex systems, you don't have causality, you have partial causality. Phenomena can exhibit, phenomena and systems can exhibit both orderly and chaotic behaviors. Cause may not lead to effect. This is the famous butterfly example. You know, it flaps its wing, creates a tornado. <coughs> much later. Reductionism and whole. Some phenomena are reducible. You can separate things, you know, there's the, there is the orthopedics ward, there is the radiography ward, you know, et cetera. You can separate them. But the linkages between them and the flows between them, you can't really separate. Predictability and unsuit. You can partially model, model them. You can model the flows of patients in and out of hospitals, et cetera. But the nation of, uh, 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 you know, do certain things. And you can partially control, but you can't know or control at all. Probabilistic, general boundaries of most phenomena uh, within these boundaries. So you've got, you know, the hospital doesn't transform into a, into a school. You know, the hospital is a hospital, but the nature within that hospital and the actual interactions and what's going on, hmm, still pretty uncertain. Two extra elements are added, emergence, complex systems demonstrate aspects of adaption and, uh, if you will, emergent behavior. So the behaviors uh, that will be happening in the future actually grow out of that. You don't know what they're going to be. They'll, they'll adapt and emerge as the system goes. And the big difference with uh, complex systems is interpretation. The actors are in the system are aware of themselves, the system, and their history, and may strive to interpret and direct them. So the actors aren't passive. They're not just cogs in the machine. They're constantly interacting with it and getting meaning out of that. Okay. Um, so, if we shift over, health policy in a complexity perspective, partial causality, fundamental targets matter. You can still focus on the basics, but the more detailed you get, 
the less certain you can be of the relevance and actual reality of those targets. Reduction in the model, at best, degrees of separation between targets. If you're telling the hospital to uh, focus on cancer patients, focus on children, focus on uh, diabetics, they're having to balance those, foci, you know, those various focuses against each other. Okay, so at best. Predictability uncertainty. Fundamental changes do matter, but so many minor ones. The classic one was the spread of uh, infection in UK hospitals. They had a rise in uh, infection-related diseases because they privatized the cleaning services. And in the privatized cleaning service, they had a tendency not to wash their hands that much. Because they were privatized. They were out in the private sector. They didn't need to wash their hands. So literally, a small thing of cleaning services not washing their hands lead to increased rate of infection. So, you know, minor ones may matter. Unknown long-term impact of all major policies. So, the anti-smoking ban, everybody agrees universally, well, that's a great thing. You know, great, well, all the indicators tell you that's gonna do great stuff. But even something as certain as that, what's the next wave of personal choice drugs, if you will, that will start influencing society? We have the vaping issue, we have the leaf marijuana legalization issue, uh, what will be the next one to emerge? I don't know, you know, there might be a new biochemical thing that's going to emerge in 10, 15 years' time. Policy emergence, policy change creates new strategies and responses, which create new strategies and responses, which create new strategies and responses. It never stops. And society doesn't reach a point, a fixed point, and just say, okay, that's it, we're done. And interpretation, public opinion shapes health, and the health sits over. It's always a democratic process. It's always a response. From uh, patient care, interventions matter, but so does feedback and interpretation. How does the patient himself feel about the intervention? What does it mean to them? Reduction is a At best, degrees of separation between illness and the individual. How do they, you know, what does that uh, illness, if you will, uh, interact, well, how does the, uh, that reshape the individual? Predictability. Fundamental innovations matter, yes, if somebody has a heart attack, fundamental innovation. So many minor ones, a slight alteration in some sort of intervention with somebody who is a jogger who now can no longer go jogging may shock their life. Right? It might just seem like a minor thing, uh, but to them it could be a major one. Probabilistic, unknown long-term impact of major interventions. <coughs> interventions create new responses by the individual which create new interventions. Again, uh, health is a process. Patients shape their health in response to intervention. They're more than robots. Again, quick thing on diabetes. I don't want to go over. Um, so, you know, work on this. Growing general emphasis on prevention, patient education, continuing increase in types of diabetes. For some time, the NHS, so I'm familiar with the UK National Health System, has put substantial money and effort into patient education for but will more and longer education, in a sense it's that argument about, well, we'll just put more money into the system, and a lot more money really lead to improved diabetes management. Hard to say, the culture is emerging, right? the various advertising that goes on, the constant pressure for this, the severe inequality in the UK where you have lower income people with very poor access to decent health choices, none of that's shifting. So yeah, you can spend more money on it in the hospitals, but unless that larger system is addressed, you might as well you know, basically waste your money. Um, sorry. So in a way, I'd say fundamentally it depends on the framework or lenses that you've you got. Traditional orderly medically framed diabetes, complicated condition, but with enough information, effort, and patient compliance, you can control it. Okay? Basic education strategies matter, but so does patient interaction. Fundamental framework of patients view their own self management In other words, shifting the way patients care as practitioners view diabetes management may actually be more important than just amplifying the same stuff you're doing. Um, uh, let's see. Well, I was given 15 minutes, right? Okay. I'll... Uh, uh, I'll <coughs> What this is, uh, and I don't want to take too long, in essence, it's a way of viewing, I try to break down uh, understanding of, di uh, this is just a diabetes example, where you're talking about higher levels of complexity. You start with, you know, your most orderly bits, if you will, your core symptoms from diabetes, you say, okay, 
These are the most orderly bits. You either have it or you don't. You have it, either blood circuits up or you don't. I mean, there's a range of it. If you will, physical complexity is sort of the next level of complexity is the flow of the blood glucose level. So in other words, if you're uh, looking at diabetes, you're saying, well, how is the, where are they positioning themselves on that? Are they high? Are they low? You're starting to get sort of a, a higher range of complexity. Then you're talking about, well, in a biological level, how does the blood glucose levels interact with other bodily systems? Okay, just because your blood glucose levels are high doesn't necessarily mean that other systems are going to do one thing or another. They can vary. Then the real thing, you move into, if you will, conscious human complexity. How, what is the normative interaction with the symptoms and therapies of the diabetic patients? How do they normatively, how do they personally understand them? And in a sense, you have a zone of discovery or high level of disorder. What's the actual outcome of the experience of diabetes for the individual? Will they look back in five years and say, you know, that was the best thing that happened to me. It shift, made me shift my life, move me into another direction, or that was the worst thing that happened to me. It ruined me. I was on a marvelous track, destroyed me. Okay? Very, very uncertain. Big thing here is thinking about methodologies. Closer you are to the orderly stuff, here's your more quantitative. Here's your heavy evidence-based gold standard medicine. Bang! You can collect really good data, you can analyze, you can model it. Great. Further you move over in the system, your quantitative edge, your evidence-based knowledge begins to fade, and you have to take on much more qualitative approaches because it's only the actor themselves that's capable of kind of understanding this and kind of coming to terms with this. So in essence, if you look at diabetes as a whole, you always have to be thinking about combining. And there isn't a hierarchy of methods. There isn't a gold standard. There's a mix. So this would be a complexity argument. Conclusion. In general, healthcare and policy is, uh, I would argue very strongly, a normal complex adaptive process. More money or central or oversight will not automatically solve the continually evolving, challenging, sounds of face. Individual health, constantly evolving, complex, and are nested in a variety of physical, biological, social systems. Health as balance rather than end state. Diabetes, stress, chronic pain, other chronic can easily fit into a complexity framework. Holistic, multifaceted responses are just as scientific. In other words, I tend to be very much as a methodological pluralist uh, and uh, try to really say, well, actually, from a complexity framework, um, there are methodologies that are more appropriate, but there isn't a hierarchy where this is the best and we always should be sh sh shooting at this. Uh, and I think complexity tools and concepts help to shift the framework of health into what I would say a more balanced direction. Few thoughts on the Canadian context in relation to the health economics policy and law. Um, depending on the situation, more complexity as a strategy is not necessarily the answer. It's always about balancing. Canadian context is your prescription drug cover. Uh, Canada created a national health system linked to its provinces. UK actually has a unified prescription uh, drug strategy that enables it as a large purchaser to do very well in terms of controlling its drug costs. Uh, so in certain policy areas, a more unified, structured, and controlled approach can actually have lots and lots of benefits. So that's an interesting question for the Canadian case. Problems of institutional rigidity and uh, all systems, all policy systems, have elements of institutional rigidity in them. So whichever policy you are, the historical trajectory always projects sort of a constraint on it. And at the same time, so you have that problem with that rigidity, you also have what's punctuated equilibrium. All of a sudden, a point can come, an issue, an actor, where the thing shifts radically. I mean, this would be, I'm sorry, who's the gentleman in the Canadian health, who's famously said is he's the one who really created the Canadian national health system? Yes. So the question would be, if that man had died in a car accident when he was a child, would Canada have had the same system? Don't know. I mean, historically, you can never rerun history. Uh, issues about strengths and weaknesses of federalism and incre incrementalism. All sorts of interesting stuff came up in the, in the um, uh, special issue. And one of the other ones that was interesting is a quote, importance of context. Every health system has weaknesses that need to be addressed. And this is linked to the idea of comparing one system to another. Whenever you're doing a comparison, 
an orderly approach or a mechanical approach would be say, right, oh look, they do it really well. Let's copy exactly what they do and put it into our system. Problem with that is the expectation that you're sh lifting up a system structure and dropping it into your own and it'll do the same thing. The reality is it'll start interacting with the existing structure and produce different outcomes. So you always have to remember whenever you're comparing, whenever you're looking at these things, each system has its own dynamic. You have to recognize your own limits of knowledge and the limits of comparison. I am a big comparativist. I always push comparison on it. But always remember the limits of this time. Thank you very much. Right, yes, hello. I'm, I'm fortunate that I can uh, piggyback on what Robert has already done in terms of outlining more complex theories. So he had the difficult bit of trying to fit all of that and just talking about diabetes into one presentation, whereas I can just do the, um, the mental health law bit um, with a only a little bit of background about complexity theory. So I'll do what Robert did first um, and just sort of say where I'm coming from. It was interesting to see that there's quite a large number of lawyers in the room, um, so it's obviously no pressure for me. But um, I'm a constitutional administrative lawyer by training, so I um, say like most of my teaching is in sort of general public and administrative law to first year undergraduates, so I lead the, the first year court cohort. Um, and that's how I originally came to complexity theory. I don't know if Robert will actually remember, but while I was, I did my PhD at Lancaster, um, to my undergraduate degree at Lancaster, I've been at Lancaster for a long time. Um, but while I was doing my PhD at Lancaster, in my first term, I was sort of casting about for, you know, what, what am I actually going to do this PhD on? And Robert just happened to be organizing a complexity theory conference sort of across the road from my office. I thought, it's a great way to procrastinate. I will go to this free to attend conference, like a good PhD student. Um, and I was like, oh, actually, this sort of fits. So. Um, since then, I've been thinking about how you can apply complexity theory to law. And more recently, I've started to sort of separately to that get into mental health law, um, especially safeguards around uh, for people who are detained under the Mental Health Act or who are subject to compulsory treatment orders, community treatment orders, in, uh, when they're living outside of hospital. And so this uh, talk is sort of an attempt, really, to start to think about how you might marry up the law and complexity stuff I've been thinking about, and the, um, the sort of what I, would, what I would say are the complex issues in mental health law. Um, so what I'm going to try and talk about, I'm going to try and frame that, is through the idea of legal certainty. Because there's loads of lawyers, that's great. I can sort of and I can sort of gloss over uh, exactly what I mean by legal certainty. I think it's fairly self-explanatory anyway. I will say something about it, but and then I can get on to applying it to. Um, a particular section of the mental health act to sort of look at how um, a complexity perspective changes how we think about the legal framework and what the legal framework is for and maybe some of the limitations of that. So this is a particularly um, explicit understanding of legal certainty, like a really sort of quite formalistic version from um, by Michael King and Anton Schutz, who are um, orthopoetic systems theorists. I won't go into what that is, but all you really need to know is it's sort of closed systems theory thinking, self-referential. Uh, self but the sentence I want to draw everyone's attention to is it's on the bottom. Law and not the individual is able to normatively, is able normatively to maintain its expectations even where they are counterfactual. And what they're saying there is that it doesn't matter whether people break the law. The law knows what the law is. The legal system knows what the law is. It is determinable. You can tell it is. And although that is a really, that's probably at the more extreme end of what people think of when they think about legal certainty. You can see a pattern through legal history um, where legal theorists have always tried to work out how they can pin down what the law is. So they can tell other people, this is what the law is. Our particular theoretical model will tell you what the law is. So you can know the law. There's a really important component of the rule of law that people should be able to know what the law is in their jurisdiction and behave accordingly, you know, can plan their lives by it. And you see that in sort of more formalistic versions of the rule of law, like Joseph Raz, as well as on you know, more substantive rights orientated versions of the rule of law, like um, Tom Bingham, Lord Bingham, um, who I'm, I'm saying that now, and you may be unfamiliar with Lord Bingham, I don't know, but he was a very senior judge, uh, died recently um, in the UK. Um, so this idea of certainty pervades legal thinking, and quite sensibly, because you know, it's, in principle it's a great idea. People do need to be able to know what the law is. The problem is, <coughs> If we think about, especially what Robert was saying about <coughs> the nature of complex systems, context is really important, and the nature of the parts and how they behave with one another is very important. 
So different actors will interpret the law to mean different things. And even if you appear before a judge, you know, purportedly in the hope that the judge will give you a clear-cut answer about what the law is, that's more of a myth than, you know, it's a myth that everyone buys into because you want a legitimate legal system that everyone would be happy about the outcomes for. But the judge isn't determining what the law is. They're trying to make a, you know, a sensible, rational decision that fits in the context of the legal system that they know they're operating and they're very familiar with, you know, high skilled professionals. But the way that that is, to, to present that as that, that decision was the inevitable outcome when the trial or whatever it was started is to sort of misunderstand the nature of what we mean when we talk about legal certainty. Because we don't mean the law is fixed like a lot of legal theories would talk about. We, I would say that we should think about legal certainty as this sort of emerging from interactions, so emerging from uh, the way that people um, understand the law, the way they come together, um, in, for example, in trial situations, but also you know, when you're thinking about drafting legislation, or when you're going to your lawyer to get some advice about how you should, you know, maybe you want to set up a business, how, what's the best structure for that. Um, and no one actually knows what the law is, but we do need a, a system to sort of get, to get along. Like for society to function, everyone needs to buy into a way of making decisions about what the law is. So I'll try and, um, I'll come back to this idea in a little bit, but I just want to focus on the text of the legislation of the Mental Health Act in the UK. Um, so this is, I've, I've just sort of copied the text, I've tried to make it a bit more readable by dropping out some of the um, stuff that's been repealed, but this is the um, section of the Mental Health Act in the UK that allows someone to be detained in hospital for treatment. So the first time you are detained under this section, it can be for a period of six months, that can be renewed for a further six months, and then after that it's renewed in 12 month increments. Um, but there are some key sort of elements that I've highlighted here which could be boiled down into these questions. Um, is a person suffering from a mental disorder, is it of a nature or a degree, it doesn't have to be both, um, which make it appropriate that they receive treatment in hospital? Is it necessary for the safety of that person or for other people's safety that that treatment take place in hospital rather than in the community? And is appropriate treatment available? Now, I'm not going to have time probably to talk about each of these in turn, but I'll try and talk a bit about maybe uh, the first and third questions first one, what is a mental disorder, is quite interesting, and the third one is really about risk, and obviously risk is very difficult to quantify, it's one of the big challenges that people face when they're making decisions about whether or not, for example, to detain someone in hospital. The key thing, though, from the point of view of thinking about legal certainty, is that all of these questions have to be answered yes. So the person must have a, an identifiable mental disorder, it must be of a nature or a degree that warrants treatment in hospital. They must pose a risk to themselves or others, and they, they must be a great recruitment available. If the answer is to any of those questions is no, then you can't detain them. And if your belief is that um, the person should be treated in hospital, then you need to find a way of answering yes to these quite you know these, these questions. And that implies that the answers to these questions are clear, cut, and simple. Because the law, in order for every, for, and I'll come on to talk about it a bit later, but the law needs, people need to know what the framework is, they need to know what the terms of the argument are that they're going to be having. You know, if you're a patient, you need to know how you, you know, what's the language that you've got to use to challenge your detention. If you're a doctor, you've got to know what's the language you've got to use in order to make sure that professionally you're fulfilling your responsibilities. If you're a politician, thinking about, you know, what are people's rights in this context, you've got to be able to articulate what the, what the parameters of that are. So if you that's the function that law is serving here, the legal framework is serving here, is to give people the framework to have that discussion so that everyone knows the terms of the debate. That doesn't mean that the answers are not debatable. It means that people are at least on the, you know, they, they're, on the, they're closer to being on the same page than they otherwise would be. And the best way to think about this, and I've, I've filtered this from, um, from Robert, but, um, Robert first introduced me to this diagram. It's really, well, I think it's really intuitively helpful for working out the types of decisions that are happening in this context. So I'll just explain what the Stacey diagram is a bit, um, and then I'll go on and try and apply that back to the, to the section of mental health that I was just talking about. So on the left-hand axis, we've got, at the bottom left, high agreement, and at the top, 
far from agreement. And what that means is, bottom left, high political agreement. All the political actors agree what the outcome should be. At the top, there's a lot more, there's a significant political disagreement about the outcome. Along the bottom, factually or technically, scientifically, people have high levels of certainty about what the outcomes are or what the solution to the problem is. And going towards this end of the axis, people have, you know, the, the out, what should be the appropriate, you know, factually or scientifically is the appropriate response, people don't really know. So this leads to several different zones of decision making. So zone one, all the political actors agree and all of the sort of the scientists, the, the experts also agree um, in the sense of being certain about what's the appropriate course of action to take. So they're able to make quite technocratic decisions. So decisions that are certain, that are objective, that are, able, you know, that they, they don't have political content, um, they all go into zone one. Zone two, that's where although people might have a high degree of certainty about the sorts of, you know, what the problem is, they've identified the problem, there'll be high levels of disagreement about, politically, about how to go about solving that problem. Along the bottom in zone three, you've got, you've, that's a situation where, although there's quite high political agreement about that there is a problem that needs to be fixed, for example, um, there's not really, it's not really exactly clear how you go about solving it. So, you leave the decision making to professionals, to experts who are involved in that particular decision making system. So in four in the top right, that's where if things are both, there's high disagreement and high uncertainty, people are sort of groping in the dark about what the solutions are to the problems there. And then zone five, which I think is the most, is the most important zone, and where I would say a lot of decision making really takes place, um, is where you're trying to balance these competing political, fact, fact, factual information, trying to deal with actors who are um, who have very strongly held views about different things, where some of the um, questions you're trying to deal with are very chaotic and uncertain. You're trying to draw it all, it's actually all best resolved in zone five. Um, so, I got a bit carried away and decided I would try and do some animation on experience. I just discovered this feature in like, that you could, anyway. Um, very modest amount of animation. But anyway, what this um, diagram shows um, is that if we think about what legal certainty is trying to do, it's trying to make people feel that the, the law is objective, that it is, and objectiveness equates to fairness. So rather than thinking of any legal decisions as being political, or rather than thinking of them as being highly discretionary, you try to convert them, using the concept of legal certainty, into being technocratic decisions, or to being objective decisions. So you try and push political, like zone two political and zone three discretionary decisions into zone one. You try to present them as zone one type decisions. In the UK, and I'm not sure what the Canadian context is, but in the UK, Proportionality as a concept for judicial decision makers, for example, is really, it's only very recently become sort of acceptable and we don't really yet know what we want to do with it. We're fine using it in relation to European Union legislation, although obviously for extraneous political reasons that uh, might not be an issue for much longer. And we're very um, used to dealing with it in the context of the European Convention on Human Rights and applying that in the UK context. But outside of those two specific jurisdictional areas, proportionality is very new. And the reason people feel uncomfortable about that is that in the UK at least, we don't have a judicial tradition of the judges sort of intervening in high level policy. But in order to make pragmatic and proportional decisions, or to decide whether a decision maker was behaving proportionately or pragmatically, you need to, um, you need to make policy judgments. Judges get slightly more involved in policy, the fact, looking at the facts, weighing up the facts. So that is seen as pushing those decisions that makes them political. They see proportionality as actually it's a political thing, and they so pushing. They see zone five things as happening in zone two, or as happening in zone three. They're very discretionary. So it makes people in the UK, at least in the UK legal system, feel a bit uncomfortable. Um, if we last bit of animation, but if we think about it in terms of section three, you can of the Mental Health Act, you can see again that these ideas are present as well. So one of the things I do outside of my academic work is I sit as what's called a hospital manager. It's a bit like a tribunal and hospital managers panels, but they one of the things the thing they have the power to do is to discharge people from compulsory mental health care against medical advice. 
And as part of that, you get to see um, medical reports prepared by responsible clinician, the patient's responsible clinician to explain why they think the section, the detention order should be upheld. And what's interesting, if you look over a period of time, a person's diagnosis will have changed. And it normally changes because the, the, the clinician in charge of their care changes and they reach a different professional judgment. Now, the law implies that a person is being detained because they have a clear, definable mental disorder. But a person who's had long-running contact with mental health care services might have had multiple diagnoses and been detained multiple times over the course of their lives. And their mental disorder, although its character as it affects them, will have sort of occupied the same sort of area of their, of, will have been relatively similar over time, the label that's being attached to it is jumping, jumping around quite a bit, which sort of makes a mockery of the certainty that's implied by that answering in the affirmative to question one, the patient has a mental disorder. It's the same with risk. Risk is very difficult to quantify, and actually when you talk to mental health care professionals, they're really interested in positive risk taking. Because how do you enable somebody to demonstrate that they're not at risk if you've got them locked up in a secure, protective environment? You know, they can't demonstrate that if, let, you know, if allowed to go out into the community and live independently, that they're not going to be a risk to themselves or others. So you have to find ways of allowing them to take risks, but at the same time, the legislation requires you to say they are a risk themselves or others. So they have to be kept in hospital. So it's, what it's doing is it's trying to, the law presents these questions as being answerable in a zone one technical sense. But actually, they are zone two, zone three, zone five questions. Um, they're political, you know, the sorts of people, there's a lot of um, stigma around mental health and that drives a lot of political decisions. There's a lot of professional discretion being exercised by expert um, healthcare professionals, for example, legal professionals. But this means that a lot of the decision making is probably best dealt with in, in zone five. Um, and the reasons for that, and I'm conscious of the time, um, the reasons for that are to do with, as I said a little earlier, it's to do with making sure that everyone knows the terms of the debate but if you accept that all of these people are coming to the law with different questions and different priorities, then it, it changes what you think of what you think legal certainty means in this context. Because I would say these different people need an idea of legal certainty for different reasons. Patients need to be able to challenge their detention. They need to know the ways in which the law can um, impact their, you know, their personal autonomy, their bodily integrity. Healthcare professionals need to be able to prove that they have complied with the, the professional standards that they live their professional lives by in order to be accountable, in order for their insurance to still be valid, all sorts of things like that. Lawyers and judges need to be able to, certainly in an adversarial system, be able to test whether that professional's judgment was appropriate. Um, and lastly, political representatives need to be able to set the parameters in the sort of the wider social context. What does society want? Um, and what is society comfortable with, with doing. So, what I'm really saying is, I'm not saying that legal certainty as a concept is a bad thing, I think it's incredibly valuable, and I think it's a thing that we should always be striving for. We should always try to get to a point where everyone knows and thinks that the law means the same thing. But that's a very difficult thing to do in a complex social system, so instead, perhaps, you know, legal certainty is more of this myth that we want to believe the, you know, the legal system is capable of, of achieving, but actually certainty doesn't exist in the way that maybe it's often presented in a lot of legal, legal theory, and so we need to instead think of a lot of us occupying this more messy zone in the middle, where people are trying to balance lots of competing and conflicting um, priorities um, all the time. I think, yes, I think that's the end. Um, I was just going to say that perhaps the last thing is that the, the legal framework presents because of its idea of legal certainty, things is, you know, it's all very medicalized in the sense that there's a, there's a certain clear cut medical answer to the problem, but actually I prefer the biopsychosocial model, which tries to take sort of wider account of people's um, context. And I think that's, that's about all I wanted to say. I did have some stuff about Ontario, but I've, I've walked on for a little bit. So yeah, thank you very much. Why don't we throw open questions for, you, uh, for either of the, uh, the speakers? Sure, fire away. <laughs>
Please, go ahead. Hi, um, welcome, both of you. Uh, Tom, I was going to meet you tonight. Oh. <laughs> I'm going to meet a little bit earlier on John Mark Keyes. Oh, let's meet John Mark. I'm sorry, right now. <laughs> sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Uh, and, uh, yeah. um, uh, Robert, we met, of course, on Sunday night at my place. Um, other answer in, in listening to you, again, this has been a great refresher for me to try to introduce you guys tomorrow at the other conference. Um, I was wondering about artificial intelligence and what's its role in trying to grapple with complexity? And, um, and I was trying to think of you know, how you would situate this in the medical context. Um, the great example that's ongoing today outside of that context is driverless cars. Uh, we're trying to solve the issue of traffic accidents and traffic injuries with driverless cars. <laughs> and maybe we'll do that, maybe we won't. Um, and you know, maybe in the medical context, are we trying to solve it through robots uh, performing medical procedures? Uh, take the human element out of some of these procedures and you just have a robot, you know, performing surgery or whatever. How do you see artificial intelligence playing in the world of, of complexity? Is it going to help or maybe not? Well, I mean, we just had a discussion with Colleen about, uh, so, you know, the question of do you use uh, so uh, again, I'm more familiar with the UK context. Um, so, do you? Uh, uh, the National Health Service encouraging people when they're not feeling well to call into a central telephone line to discuss before they decide to go visit their GP. And one of the things is, well, do you create algorithms rather than have a, uh, in essence, a, a call answerer there, looking at a protocol sheet in front of them? You know, they say their tummy hurts. You, know, you then ask them this, and you can enter this. Well, you know, why not just use an artificial intelligence program that asks them, walks them through questions, talks to them in various ways. I mean, the immediate thing that kick, that goes into my mind, uh, you know, you're clearly going to see more and more of that over time. That technology is sort of moving forwards, similar with the driverless cars. But I would I would go back to the the, the diagram, the Stacy diagram, where I say, well, actually, with all of those things. You've got a political element, uh, so you'll have a technical element going on as the various programmers work on the algorithms to find out the right stuff, and the limits of that, because there'll be different people answering those questions. They pick up the phone. It, an elderly will interpret, you know, an elderly person with uh, a certain experience will interpret the questions. And how much pain do you have? Uh, to one person, that'll mean one thing to another. You know, uh, you know what's what's bothering you. You know, the, you know working through those interpretations. So in other words, if you will, there's always a political element going in there. That's on our Stacy diagram. Then there'll be a judgmental element that the algorithm will still struggle with of interpreting what, okay, what's this person, how do we identify this? So you're already quickly into a zone where, yes, you can increase the probabilities of that, you can you can do stuff with it, but you're immediately going to bump into the unpredictability and the, and the, the, the nature of complex system and normative complex systems are uh, with how it can do that. So on the one hand, how much, you know, I certainly see, you'll see progress on that. You're going to see movement on that, but it's going to start interacting with human norms. So it'd be an interesting question. I was just thinking of driverless cars. Imagine a society that's trying to project itself as a modern society, and they want more driverless cars on, because they think normatively that'll make them feel more modern, more advanced. Versus another thing that says, no, we want our you know, we uh, we want to stay traditional. So literally, rather the uh, rather than evaluating it on the effectiveness of the cars, they're literally doing it on the normative values uh, linked to that. And also, if you think about the culture of cars and how, particularly in, as an American, that car culture that emerged out the ownership, the control, uh, pickup trucks, SUVs, etc. Uh, what will be the cultural implications? It will feed back into that larger system. So technically, I think drivers, driverless cars are clearly possible. Uh, it's a question of, and then, and then the acceptance all sort of goes into that stuff. So to me, yeah, no, just like, I mean, my argument, I, you know, I'm a convert or I'm a fanatic. So I see complexity in any policy area. It just depends on how you look at it. And there's no magic solution in the United No, it's in a sense, it's no magic solution, and different country, different policy actors in different contexts will automatically view it differently. And this is that point about comparison that was flagged up in the journal. Uh, even if you saw another country that said, "Oh, well, we established our driverless cars this way," 
uh, well, okay, great. So uh, 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 Ottawa City said, yeah, we want to start allowing driverless cars here. There'll be political implications of that. What about all the cycle? You have these fantastic cycle lanes, you know, I, I, which I'm a big supporter of. Now, how are the driverless cars going to be interpreted by the cyclists? Uh, will they see it as safer? Uh, or will they be nervous about this? Now, does that mean that you actually, it, politically, you then am, wind up amplifying or building up your cycle lanes even better? You know, so there's a barrier for them that protects them even more. Uh, versus others who have no cycle lanes whatsoever, they're like, oh, great, we'll take these driverless cars because who cares about the cyclists? There's only a few of them anyway, and if they get in the way, it's their fault. Anybody would be fewer after that. Yeah, so uh, I, it's that in a sense. I guess my point is to say is to take the, the general framework and you, uh, all I've done is plonk your issue into it. There's one back. Uh, uh, Colleen and then Tom back. So Tom, my question for you, I have two quick to both of you. So Tom, how do you actually make resolve in zone four there uh, pragmatically in the context of mental health law? So I'll ask you that. Uh, but for you, Robert, um, uh, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not really uh, persuaded. Um, it seems to me that, uh, sure, things are complex, sure. but how does complexity theory help us do anything? Mm -hmm. I see a lot of people in policy saying things are so complex, for example, in indigenous health, that's a rationale for doing nothing. Mm -hmm. um, you gave the example of kind of the targets in terror, uh, mode of reform in in the UK, which I thought was interesting. You held it up as an example of a problem that things that there is periodically restructuring in the in the UK healthcare system, and yet the UK healthcare system, uh, by all metrics, is adjudicated the best right. in the world. We can't get ourselves to do anything. We have another commission, we write another report. Mm -hmm. We don't reorganize because we can't actually get organized enough to reorganize. Mm -hmm. We're trapped by complexity. We can't get to a point where we say that there's, there's enough evidence here to make a move, even if it is something that we is not perfect that we have to come back at and try again. So I thought it was pretty interesting that you, you gave that as an example, because to me, the fact of change, the fact of responding to a problem, how can that be evidence that a more kind of uh, linear um, approach is a problem? So a lot of what you've, to me, so a lot of what you've discussed, for example, like incentives, um, people don't react uh, in a straightforward way to incentives, and so there's a lot of evidence from um, behavioral economics, and, yep. you know, to explain that they're not going to do that. But that's not that hard to dig it up. Why is that really that complex? That's just sure. gathering the, sure. the evidence. Um, or, to me, as a comparativist, uh, it is also, of course, evident that you can't pick up one reform and drop it into another country. You have to calibrate it for the context of the system that you're working with. But I think most comparativists would say, it's not that it's easy, but it's not so complex that you can't do, do it, right? Attempt to do it with the best evidence you have. So, you know, as a policymaker, I think at any point, at any time, you have the evidence that you have, um, and Doing nothing is also a decision. Mm -hmm. So you have to make a, you have, you're making decisions all the time and the best thing you can do is get as much evidence as you possibly can to make the best decision, even if it's doing nothing. So I guess I'm challenging you a little bit on the yep. complexity stuff, but be really interested to hear pragmatically, how do we, you know, so how do we actually determine this uh, in the context of whether or not we continue to incarcerate someone who's mentally ill, for example. So I think um, it's, it's a bit like what Robert was saying about how some, in some parts of the system, even something that's you know really complicated, like how to deal with mental health with different actors, they're different ideas. Some things are still technocratic. Like it, if you have high demand for bed space in hospitals and you don't have enough beds, 
you need a policy that produces more beds. There will be side effects to that policy. Now, if you say, well, you've got to have, you've got 50 beds at the moment, you need to have 75. You've got to do that. That might result in, in order for you to find the money to have that, that will probably result in a cut somewhere else. But you can still see how, if that's your, if that's what you value as being important in the system, then there's a space for technocratic decision making in mental health. But the other th problems, particularly with the sort of zone two political and zone three discretionary stuff, and the zone four sort of um, the highly unpredictable aspect of um, caring for people with mental health, it's to do with, you know, their social situations can be very unstable. That's what can precipitate a lot of their mm -hmm. problems. Um, I think people try to think about the legal framework as a way of controlling all of those competing interests, political disagreement, mm -hmm. exercise of professional discretion, and just very complicated social circumstances. <coughs> but actually, the, I suppose what complexity is saying is that it's, you're not, it's, a, it's partly about saying you've got to accept that the law is not you know, producing more law, writing better and clearer laws on its own, Having you know even you know even having legal actors who are more well, more familiar with the sorts of issues that they're dealing with is not on its own going to produce better outcomes because the nature of the system you're dealing with is is this mixture of different areas of decision making technocratic political discretionary and just sort of this um, more un more unstable element in terms of. <coughs> So it's about saying the only appropriate way for you to deal with this is to try and draw things into zone five, not try and push them off into any particular, any of the other particular zones. And that means accepting, I mean, certainly in the UK where people are only just sort of starting to feel comfortable with the idea of proportionality um, as a way of assessing decision making. Um, it, it does mean sort of changing the way that you approach what the law is for. Because on the one hand, you do want to make sure that you are properly explaining why someone should lose their liberty, or why you should be able to give them treatment against their consent. But on the other hand, you're already dealing with something that is, in itself, it's a very messy situation. And the fact that the law is being really clear, I mean, that, that's, it's being really clear about what the, you know, what is happening to the person, and why it's legitimate, that, that just, that just provides the decision with democratic legitimacy, but it, it doesn't solve the underlying problem. The underlying problem is much messier. So the, I think it's about recognizing that the law is not the vehicle for solving these sorts of problems. It's just the, the way in which we agree the terms of the debate, but that means allowing all the actors a bit more latitude, including you know, in how they understand what, what the law can do for them and what the law allows, because it's, yeah, I think that's, does that, am I on the way to one? So. <laughs> um, I understand the, the problem, but I, I don't understand then how a decision would be made as a result. So, so. a decision has to be made, so you're, I, I think what you're saying is, so when you talk about latitude, what do you mean by that? So well, I mean, so yes, a decision has to be made, so, you can't get away from the fact that a person is unwell and the way that we have decided to help them is articulated in this legal framework. But I think it's to do with how the information is presented to the, to the individual who you're you know, you going to detain in hospital or to their family members or to their legal representative or to society more generally. If you represent the reasons for their detention as being clear-cut and objectively stable, like you will always say, this person has the same mental disorder this year, and if their um, disorder is relapsing and remitting, you see them again in five years' time, you'll give it the same label. You're misleading people about the nature of the thing that the law is trying to help out with. So yes, a decision needs to be made, and people need to buy into the process by which it's being made, but it's about recasting how the, you know, the certainty of that decision so it's not to undermine the legitimacy of the decision, because that's what you need. You need a legitimate decision that people accept. You need a process that people feel is fair and that people feel is balanced. 
but at the same time, if certain actors in that decision-making process are presenting themselves as the objective sort of arbiters of truth, mm -hmm. that sort of cl that closes out all these other all these other actors that have a you know have skin in the game as well. And some of them are the person, you know, some of them are the people who are losing their liberty, but they're being you know they're being told there's no there's no wiggle room for any of these these objective decisions that are being made about you when actually empirically the decisions do aren't objective over time. So it's yeah, it's about making sure it's to do with how the information is presented. It's not to do because you have to have a decision. You know, if someone appears before a judge, the judge needs to make a decision. You can't judge go, oh, this is really difficult. So yeah, it's about yeah. About, okay. I'm I'm standing here feeling a little bit cynical. So could it be that everybody realizes that the, the, both of the problems you described are actually very complex problems that would be very expensive and arduous to actually fix properly? Could it be that everybody knows, and this is a way of providing some sort of cover to do something about the immediate problem with no real desire to actually effectively address the underlying problem? Hmm. Yeah, that's, I think that's what the, the myth element is, is that everyone needs to accept that you cannot reach a final solution to this, to this loop, but there's no end end point for development, like the, there will always be this, and it will continue to change as we, you know, medical knowledge increases, as what society wants to treat as a mental disorder changes, so the, 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 the target you're aiming at is always moving, so you, yeah, so it's about having a, something that people can, you can get along with, mm -hmm. rather than, I mean, there are definitely problems with the Mental Health Act, and there, 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 there will always be problems with the Mental Health Act. And why do you insist on bringing the two together? Why don't you try to deal with them in a forum where each can be dealt with most effectively? And I think following up on Colleen's point, I mean, um, it, law is not a talk shop. You know, the whole idea of certainty is not just that people accept it. And we've had, I know some of the professors here have dealt with end of life questions where people are being kept alive, uh, you know, the state of living death. And, um, the concerns that are raised there where people say, well, I know the medical decision is such, and but I don't like that decision, and I'm going, my religion or my point of view is different. And you know, I just, I wonder why you insist on melding all together as if somehow these don't take place in different fora mm -hmm. um, and are not better dealt with in different fora. I suppose it depends what you think the role of law is, like if you think that the role of law is to just provide the answer to set to, to questions you ask it without reference to external factors, then I think you could deal with it in that way. But if you think that the law is about dealing with or trying to, if you think of sort of a wider sort of socio-legal context, you're trying to think about the law as a thing that is enmeshed, intermeshed, enmeshed, and interacting with all other aspects of society. Of course, these factors are going to influence legal legal decision making and development of the law, both in a micro sense in individual cases and in a systemic sense in terms of the you know the judge is not isolated in, in an ivory tower. The, the, the advocates are the people bringing the cases on, and the politicians helping to reform the law, change the law in different ways are not isolated either, they are all together. And the crucible in which it all comes together is often a judicial hearing or a, um, a legislative reform committee or something like that, where all of these things run into one another. So I don't think you can get away from the fact that, that whether or not you want them to, they are always going to work well, up against I don't think anyone's naive enough to assume that law is anything but an articulation of public policy which gives it some structure, and it does change depending on circumstance, scientific advancements, and so on. I just don't understand why there's this somehow assumption that um, it's uh, the, the four points that you raised that have to be answered in the affirmative. Once answered in the affirmative, uh, somehow have to then, uh, if you don't like the response, or it doesn't meet with your concern, that therefore you should continuously have the right, or right, perhaps the wrong word, to just keep stirring the stew. And I, I just, um, I just find it, I don't understand why it has to be done that way. I think all of us realize that law is inter. I mean, mm -hmm. our lives are all interactive with other 
influences and uh, but I mean, I, anyway. Yeah, yeah, I just want to actually, we, we have someone at the back who right, oh, turned yeah. on the question, um, yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. I, I had a comment and a question. Uh, in the context of a large uh, issue in Western society, which is uh, Alzheimer, uh, mental uh, cognitive disorder, people starting to lose that, I mean, anyone knows in their families, and it's starting to be a real concern, uh, both economic and health issue, and how um, the current system, for example, is always someone who's getting very losing and his memory is a very uh, critical point, and, and we're starting to, to, to look at what are we going to put in place as a, as a, as a system and develop uh, vulnerable people? But we have this thing in here, the handling power attorney, uh, where a person can sign without well, even a lawyer advice, but once it's done, it's done. So let last uh, uh, handling power attorney that was prepared, that's the one that was applied. And how, and, and, and this raised all, all sorts of issues. For, for example, it's complex. Like the illness, the doctor don't even agree. Um, and neurologists are not even sure what's what's happening in, in the brain when someone has Alzheimer. Um, is it like simply the storage memory that is that is infected, or is it just the, the, the operating memory? Where is it? Is the problem, where it's going? And sometimes this person can have very good judgment. Um, uh, we we had we we knew about the how uh, Donald Trump uh, succeed in the, in the test uh, sure. uh, of, of, of the Montreal uh, the Montreal test uh, for for his uh, uh, memory test, but of course the creator of the test says, well, it doesn't have anything to do with the judgment. <coughs> he didn't say it ironically, but he did say it. So anyway, my my, my question about it is, is, well, we have this uh, issue uh, of the, the legal effect. Of a person losing his memory uh, as in turn incrementally, but not all at the same time. So it's, it's not a, a, a yes, or it's not binary. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same time, the effect of being all of a sudden uh, um, held of his uh, control of his own affair, uh, both health and property, economic decision, could have a, a mutual effect on how this person. Uh, Behaves and and is, is is considered medically. Anyway, my question quickly is, is and also the privacy issue that, that goes on with how how this person seeing a medical doctor start to, to share disclose information to someone else. Anyway, that that's also an issue. So my question would be, of obviously complexity. Your team is really in the <laughs> very, very uh, uh, current, and my question would be. Um, how you think it will evolve uh, <coughs> Western countries and my comment and you can involve uh, my person for both my comment would be is it a, would it be a, a, a solution or a return theory of complexity to, to say okay it's complex so the judge should make a decision that leaves all options open in case there's an error for <laughs> um, well, I'll start, and then you know, Tom said mental health. I guess I want to. I'll try to weave in Colleen's point. Um, so it always are these things. That it's always your you know your context is and where your arguments are coming from and the issues you're looking at shapes your sort of view on these things. So I came you know, working in the UK system for as long as I have. Um, so what happens, the presentation uh, that I gave you was heavily focused in my own mind on the type of issues that were ha happening in the UK system, which is a highly centralized system. Local authorities, local government control 2% of their budget. The other 98% is, is determined centrally, so their ability to fluctuate. All hospitals centrally driven. Uh, I had a very good friend of mine who, again, was CEO of a local hospital in Liverpool. Every day they were supposed to hit 360 targets, the amount of effort and time that they were monitoring those targets, and they realized all the targets overlapped with each other and interacted with each other, and they knew most of that was all just wasted time and effort. Uh, their strategy were responding to that, they picked the top 10 most important ones, focused on those and ignored the rest, unless they went into a crisis zone and they paid attention. So 
the, my point about this, I was coming from, a, if you will, a UK context where, in a sense, the pushback that I've been trying to do is, in a sense, push the, a, a very centralized system into a, a little more flexible system. So it isn't just to say that, uh, you know, in a way, the language I was using, if I were coming from an American system, I would say actually the American context is highly chaotic, and which is why it's one of the most uh, ineffectual and expensive systems available. So in a sense, the language there I'd be using is actually you need to talk about more structure. You need to adopt more of, a, of an overarching framework because the very chaotic nature of what you're doing is amplifying it. What my emphasis is, is to say, whenever you're confronting these things, you're confronting a range of processes. Now, that range of processes is interacting with your society, and you can structure it in a way in each, each social structure, each province is constructing its own, in its own way. Now, that allows for lots of flexibility and lots of exploration, but in certain policy deliverable where you're having, in a sense, a universal right to health, for example, greater centralization actually gets you lots of advantages. So in my sense, I guess, was the time I didn't have a chance to project to you properly. To me, the real skill is for the politician, for the active academic, for the policy, can you find that right point? And that right point's always moving, and it's moving for different contexts. Uh, big thing to remember, the language we're using with this complexity stuff, this isn't new. Uh, complexity has this has come out of science. If you go back to the 19, uh, early 20th century, you're talking about pragmatists. You had lots of pragmatists and philosophers were saying, look, it's all about these types of things. I see this as a, as a tradition of that. And like the pragmatists from that period, the point isn't to claim the answer. The point is to create a process continually looking for the answer. And in a sense, it's always bumping up against those who are claiming, we know what the answer is. And you need to follow us to do that. So if you like, to me, it reflects a period of popular, where you always have a populist rhetoric, claiming certainty, claiming these. Complexity is a way of stripping that away and saying, actually, no, you don't. Uh, actually, you're managing these various things. We can explore how to manage it in different ways. The Alzheimer's issue, I think, is absolutely relevant. Now, the immediate question I'd say to that, who's the most important in determining what should happen to that individual when they're losing their, increasingly losing their capabilities? Their spouse, son, daughter, uncle, relative? Uh, what are the parameters of society? Will put, you know, so there'll be parameters that are put on there, but who's going to make that determining? Should the daughters be required to take care of them? You know, there's no reason why you just wouldn't make that a norm. It's previously been a norm. Uh, legalize it. All daughters are responsible for this. I mean, my, I'm just tossing, I'm not saying, <laughs> I'm not advocating. But the implication is to say, now what would be the weakness in that? Those who have daughters, uh, you're biasing a whole lot of outcomes, you're doing everything. In a sense, you're putting a rigid process around a very messy situation. Is that going to lead to the best outcome? I'd say that's highly unlikely. But in a sense, the legal system is just going to have to recognize that it's a very messy thing. And it is that way by not, I, would, I mean, Tom would be the one to be able to say, but not laying down a lot of rigid rules because they'd be counteractive more or less immediately. And at the same time, society's working through the norms for this. Uh, what do we do? The obvious one, when do you take away their driver's license? Yeah, in a sense. I think, I think I'm very sorry. We gotta go. Alright, sorry. Have a plus coming in right away, but yeah. I do, uh, please join me in thanking you very much for speaking. <laughs>